Hi guys and welcome back. We're continuing with making uh, this dress from Berda 10 2020 and today I am going to first of all start off by cutting out my button placket. The placket piece does not have any seam allowances so I have to add some seam allowances to it. The cuff pieces which are drafted yourself pieces they already have the seam allowances included and the seam allowances are 1.5 centimeters so just be aware of that if you are following along and doing that so that's going to be the first thing that i will do right now going to sew up as much of the navy blue stuff as I can first of all because my 201k is preloaded with the navy um, with the navy thread before I then move on to the mustard so uh, first thing that we're going to do very simple and straightforward it's the tie belt I just have to sew it along the outer seams uh, folded actually it has to be folded and then sewn along the um, outer seam leave a little bit of a hole so that I can then uh, turn it in and then we have the belt which needs um, some fastenings at the back so I need to kind of think about what sort of fastenings I will put on there so I'm just going to sew the the outer edges first and then I'll leave the section that's going to need some fastening until I can decide what it is I'll use and then we have the collar I'm just going to do the outer bits of the collar and leave it so that it will be ready to be attached to the bodice and those are the only navy blue uh, pattern pieces that I have and then once those are done I can change over the thread and go over to the mustard mm -hmm. When I'm sewing up tie belts or belts in general that involve one long rectangular type of thing, I tend to prefer to start sewing at the center, going right round to the one side and then starting again from the other side and going right down rather than trying to do one long seam. It just tends to work out a lot better for me and then the point at which I will turn it under is in the middle here. So I'll leave about an inch of a gap. Okay, the band has been uh, sewn up. Uh, so the tie band, that's the thing that's going to go like this. And I can just do that. Okay. Next thing is I'm going to do the collar. And I'm just going to do around the outer edges of the collar. So the idea is I'm going to do as much sewing with the navy thread as I can. And then I'll move on to just grading and trimming and then turning it out. And then I'll go and press and then I'll be done with that. I personally prefer that when I'm sewing, I want to reduce the amount of time that I'm getting up and going to the ironing board and all that, basically reducing the transaction time. And I find that it works a lot faster if I'm doing as much sewing as I can in one go before I go and do the pressing, before I do go and do the cutting out. So it may seem like it doesn't make a lot of sense, but I tend not to follow sewing instructions. It's very rare that I will follow sewing instructions. I tend to kind of do it in my own way depending on whether I'm using contrasting fabrics as you can imagine if you're using contrasting fabrics and you follow the instructions well on the one stage you might have to do the bodies and you need the mustard thread 
And then on the next stage, you're going over to do the tie build or something like that, and then you need to change the thread again. Uh, so it just works out a lot better for me, especially since I tend to, in my sewing, to use a lot of contrasting fabrics. Right, let's get on with the sewing, less talking. Okay. When I'm sewing collars, you have the one interfaced bit, and then you've got the uninterfaced bit. I prefer to have the uninterfaced um, section of the collar against the feed dog. And that's because the feed dogs, they pull the fabric in at a slightly faster rate than the upper uh, fabric. If, yeah, if you can imagine that, it's sort of like the tread on the bottom on the feed dogs where it's jagged. It tends to pull the fabric in a lot better. And if your fabric is interfaced, it doesn't actually stretch out in order to accommodate the fact that it is being eased, whereas fabric that hasn't been interfaced will accommodate that um, dragon. So if you've ever had a situation where you're sewing an uh, interfaced piece of fabric against a uh, non-interfaced piece of fabric, and then you reach the end of the seam and you find that it looks like they've sheared off and you don't understand because you cut them out exactly the same size, small tip, Uninterfaced fabric always goes against the fit dog if you've got uh, both. And then you're going to use your fingers to sort of hold it down ever so gently to try and make sure that the fabric is being fed in equally. Vintage sewing machines are pretty awesome when it comes to that because, I don't know, just engineering from ages ago was super amazing. So I tend to find that I don't have as much of a problem with it as I do with the more modern sewing machines. Okay, so interfaced down and remembering to leave the seam here a little bit open because we're going to attach this to the bodice. So we're not going to sew all the way down to the bottom of that. We're just going to, I'm using a half an inch seam allowance, so I'm going to leave a half an inch over there. Okay, so this seam is the one that's going to attach to the bodice yeah and to the body's neckline so i'm going to start sewing here that's about half an inch like that and then i'm just going to sew all the way around and leave that half an inch and that's so that i'll be able to attach this to my bodies and then i'll be able to fold that under and do my uh, sewing seamlessly okay here we go Okay, next up is the belt and we're going to sew all along that top edge and that bottom edge and we're going to leave these sides um, open because I haven't decided how that's going to work. Okay, so now I have my tie belt, my collar and the waist belt. Uh, they're ready now. So I'm going to use my good old fashioned pinking shears. I'm just going to trim the corners. And I'm going to turn them out, give them a nice press, and then I'll put them to the side. And they will come into play at a much later stage when I get to finishing off my bodies with the collar. And when I get to the point where I try and figure out what to do with the belt. But it means that I don't have to worry about loading the machine again with a different thread and what have you. <laughs> So now that I've trimmed and turned over all of these things, I'm going to give them a lovely little press 
and that will be it so another reason why i try and make sure that i do things like this at the beginning is because i had a really bad habit of skipping things because i get so excited towards the end of a project and i cannot cannot wait to finish and so i'll do things like oh but do i really need a tie belt do i really need a waist belt you know i, I you know i would start skipping steps so if ever there are any parts i do try and get them done at the beginning where i've got copious amounts of sewing energy and you know for um for the project itself so that's helped me to kind of uh, be consistent and true with the sewing projects that I have. So pressing Moroccan crepe, I'm going to use uh, a pressing cloth because I don't want it to have this um, shiny uh, shininess to it. So I'm going to use the silk organza press cloth, which I made myself. I just bought um, some half a meter of silk, 100% uh, silk organza overlocked the edges uh, sewed down a little ribbon for it to hang from and i've never looked back i've had this for i think about five years now so it's a good piece of fabric right so we're going to press these and then change over the thread in the sewing machine So I've ended up needing to use the clapper and that's because with the crepe being interfaced, it's got a slightly, I want to say a little bit of a spongy texture when you do a seam with it. So it kind of lifts and curves. It's really beautiful if you're going to be doing a uh, hot couture stuff, I guess, if you want to have that unpressed seam look. But personally, I, I like for my seams to be nice and flat, as flat as you can get them. So I'm using my trusty clapper. Ta-da! Oh, look at that belt! Look at that point. Look at that. And boom. Yeah, or do you go like this? Uh-huh. Okay, okay, okay. I like. <laughs> I approve. I approve of this. Love it. Guess if it had even stiffer interfacing, I could make it into a headband contact. Lovely. Okay, so uh, pressing is going to get done and these are going to go into the project uh, box. Collar. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Actually, separately, I think that these colors go really well together as well. What do you think? I always get so excited when I get to this point where, you know, just these random flat pieces of things come together and they make something. So I had just like two odd looking shapes, sewed them together and you've got something that looks like a collar. So, yay! <laughs> this is what I mean about the poofiness of the seam. So this is an unpressed seam, what it looks like. And then that's why it looks like pressed. So it does have, if you like the hot couture look, this could be a nice thing to have. But I, I, I like to, to press everything out. I like them nice and flat. But, you know, maybe one day I might make a just a little neck scarf. And it's got the poofiness. So there's my neck tie belt. Guys, I think I have found a new use for scrap pieces of fabric. Just make myself some lovely little neck belts like that. <laughs> okay, so we have one more thing to do with this one before we're done with it. So remember, we had to leave a gap so that we could turn it inside out. 
um, hand sewing or using a sewing machine, your choice. We just need to cover um, that up. I am going to do some hand sewing uh, simply because it looks very, my fabric looks really nice and neat. And if I do a top stitching line, it's not going to look all of that great. So I'm just going to take the extra five minutes to do just a little bit of hand sewing. My gap really is small. It's no more than an inch, so I don't need a lot of thread and it's not even going to take me five minutes. I overestimate it. It's probably going to take me a couple of minutes. That's it. Done. Not even a minute. But it does look a lot better than just by top stitching it. I suppose if I wanted to just top stitch all around it, you could do that, but I don't want to. But yeah, we've got a tie belt. So I think I'm about 5% done now. If you imagine the sewing project as a download bar, which is kind of how I see the sewing projects. It's like a download bar. I'm now like at the 5% mark. Yay. <laughs> I realized that I'd forgotten to cut out the pocket uh, pattern pieces because as I mentioned previously, I'm actually going to move away from the double weld pockets at the front and actually do some side seam uh, pattern pieces. This is my standard template that I use for uh, pocket side seam pocket pattern pieces. I'm actually going to repurpose this fabric that I had cut out for the weld pockets. I can just about get this um yeah because this is a pattern piece that i use quite a lot whenever i add pockets onto any pattern it doesn't it, it lives on the wall where i sort of like i pin it onto the wall until it's ready for the next one. I also have different types of pattern uh, pocket templates. So I've got a pocket template that has a pocket that goes onto the waistline. Um, I don't know what those types of pockets are called, but yeah, so this is where my uh, pocket piece goes. I always do a test run after I've re-threaded a machine because it's not unheard of for me to sometimes just make a little bit of a mistake and then it doesn't work well. So it's always a good idea to just take a little bit of time just to do like a little thingy and I did it. And I'm always amazed at what a beautiful stitch I get from my Singer 201K. Love it. Okay. So that's what our seam line is going to look like. Beautiful. Okay, skirt pattern pieces. I only have 10 more minutes left, which I'm hoping is going to be enough time to do the darts and to also interface the place where my uh, pocket pattern piece is going to go. I'm going to start off with the easy bit, the darts on the skirt back, which I already pinned out. I started the widest part of the dart, do a little bit of a backstitch, go all the way down and about an inch away from my dart point. I'll reduce the stitch length and then I'll just finish it off. And when I do that, it means that I don't have to do that um, really annoying and silly thing where you have to tie the ends of your thread on every single dart for fear that it will unravel. But if you use a smaller stitch length, then your darts will not unravel. So that's what I'm going to do. I do have to rush off, so I thought I'd have time to do the pleats, but I don't. Um, I'm just going to do these and pack up. Anyway, I hope that you've enjoyed that. I will see you tomorrow when we're going to be doing loads more, loads more sewing. Bye.